I think I'm going to start that side. We had an amazing elephant this morning. We must have seen, I mean, that one herd I told you, there's about 50 yeah. of them. So we're going to look for some more hillies and just get to know that area. I mean, we are learning new roads, new areas, still a bit of rehearsals in terms of the technical aspect. So it's a lot of sort of exploring Absolutely. and um, I think it's going to be fun. And then I'm going to head over here sunset time, I think. Okay, that sounds like a plan. So Pete and I will meet back over here. We've got a really, really good feeling about leopards tonight, mate, haven't we? I think one of them, Karula, one of the boys, something like that. So towards sunset, I'm going to be over here. I think the easiest, we'll talk on the radio, but I might see you as well. We'll see how it goes. Okay. But for now, I'm going to get over there. Um, Brian's on camera with me as well. He's sitting there on the other vehicle and um, enjoy the drive. I'll see you soon. Okay, mate, have a good, good luck, mate. Yes, Take care. So we're going to head around this area. I want to go to a couple of water holes at the moment because it's 29 degrees Celsius, about 84 Fahrenheit. It's pretty hot today. And uh, at this time of the day, the cats are definitely going to be still resting or holed up somewhere or flat, basically what we call flat cat. And they'll be just under a tree or in a really shady area. A little bit trickier to find. Uh, so I just thought whilst it's really, really hot, we should go and explore some of the water points and see if there's just some animals down there enjoying themselves, getting one of their daily drinks or wallowing or something like that. So I think Pete's going to go that direction. We're going to turn around and go that direction. Thanks for coming. It's great to have you on board. This is our sunset, our sunset game drive from Juma Game Reserve. Pete's going over to Arethusa. Uh, coming to you live from Sabi Sands in South Africa. I hope the leopard doesn't get dinner, huh? <laughs> okay, mate, take care. Okay, let's go. So it's a, when the sun uh, is out, it's pretty, uh, pretty hot here today. But when the cloud comes over a little bit, it's not so bad, it's, it's comfortable. Uh, I'm just looking all around. We're going to stop and see some birds if we can. We always try and stop to see birds. Uh, it just depends on what's there. And I know how hard it is when someone says, did you see that? And it flies off and it's this little black dot up in, the, up in the top of a tree. And if you haven't got your binoculars with you, it can be a little bit tricky. So I'll, I'll sort of gauge it on what birds I see and how easy they are to see uh, for you and then tell you a little bit about them and uh, it's just a great thing to always look for birds because I think I've mentioned it before you could drive for about I don't know an hour and not see a mammal uh, you might talk about some trees or some of the landscape but then you'll always see birds birds are all around us and they play an integral role in the ecosystem and the food chain and uh, always really important to understand a little bit about their habitat uh, sorry their habits as well It's so good to have you on board. We've had a lot of uh, really great feedback and support from everyone out there. Uh, it's tricky out here, you know. Uh, we've got a, a really seriously great team behind this with loads and loads of technology, but we are going to have little glitches when we go down into dips, you know, down into the gullies or into the, the dry riverbeds. And, uh, you know, if we do have those, I do apologize in advance for that, uh, but we're really doing our best to, to get this to you live from South Africa here on uh, these two beautiful reserves, uh, Juma and Arethusa. Now, these reserves are known for their extraordinary uh, animals and abundant wildlife, and most of the wildlife is uh, really habituated or, or familiar with the vehicle, so that's one of the great benefits for us. Uh, for you being on game drive with us today, we've got a great opportunity to get really close to a lot of species without them feeling uh, intimidated. And that's one of the codes of conduct, and I always mention that. Our job is to take you to the animals, show the animals with great respect to their environment and their, their space, and really not over intrude on that. And uh, most of the animals here, I tell you what, they just, we're just part of the furniture, really. Lovely little herd down here of, of uh, impala and uh, a zebra, a lone zebra there. There might be a few more zebra uh, just around, just around uh, the area off into the, the woodland. And you'll find that two different species often uh, graze together. More eyes the better. Um, always important to, uh, to have lots of eyes on the, on the ground. And what they'll do is um, make sure they look after each other. The, 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 the zebras have got, it's in their mutual benefit to uh, to do that and you'll see that happen quite often uh, with many different species. Fildebeest will sometimes join them as well 
Uh, and sometimes you'll see buffalo grazing quite close as well. Conserve a little bit of So I'm going to make my way down to a water hole here and uh, we are going to go across the peat because I think he's got some elephant. I'll be right back soon. Well, uh, welcome this side again. Hope you enjoyed the zebra. We uh, actually found something quicker than we thought. I was on my way heading west and we came across these illies. This is that little group that we've seen quite a few times now over the last few days. Uh, which ones shall we look at? These ones. Yeah. Hello. Well, these guys are nice and used to vehicles. They've been almost just camping out on this uh, Waitella access road. Basically, it's uh, this youngster, looking at about probably three years old. The female in the back, you can recognize her easily from a couple of small markings on her ear. I'll point some of them out later. Very interestingly, she's that female. Let me just roll back slightly for you, Brian. She's that female with. Uh, a little bit of a trunk missing. Just look right at her in front of her as well if that bird stays close by. You can see there's a bird flying around. Sorry, I'm talking about different things at the same time. But the trunk is missing the front part, but it's literally not influencing her at all. She's still picking up things. Keep in mind the trunk has got an incredible amount of muscles in it. Uh, depending on which books and sort of explanations you read. I can't do anything about it. It's maxed out. Basically, the trunk is still adapted with all the muscles that it has to, to still fulfill everything that it needs to do. It's a very lazy mood here. This little guy is, uh, as you can see, flapping his ears. It's quite hot. I think HD actually got the exact temperature, but I would guess this to be in the sort of high 20s, which in the low felt feels hotter. So the real feel is probably about a 33 degrees Celsius, and Fahrenheit that's about uh, about 80 or so, 83, 84, somewhere around that. But because it's quite humid and there's not much wind this afternoon, it does feel quite warm. For the elephants, they can't sweat like we do, so they don't get evaporative cooling. They've got other mechanisms. Swimming, having a mud wallow, that's one of the sort of big ones. But the most important one, or the main one, is the ears. That's the main mechanism of coping with hot weather. The ears can make up, or makes up, up to about 20% of the exposed body surface area, which is quite crazy if you think about it. But keep in mind the ear has got two sides to it, so if you double the ear, compare that to the rest of the body you can actually see that quite easily and that's very important because that's where they get rid of a lot of the heat through so the blood runs through the ears in a fine network flapping the ears the breeze moving across it the ears cool down let's pull up here Hello. Okay, we're looking at a little bit more. Sorry, just hold on, guys. There we go. Mmm, that's a good snack. Eating the twigs at the top, nice fresh leaves. That's a zebra thorn. She might eat some of the roots as well. Yeah, there is a perfect view of the trunk. 
it's amazing how they can adapt to, to things like that. That could be the equivalent, I think I said the other day, you know, if you take a person that's maybe lost, not the thumb, but maybe two fingers on the one hand. So you've still got other, th other fingers that you can use. It will bother you a little bit, but nothing too serious. You would not even think about it anymore. Maureen from Nottingham is asking, how can you tell if a female elephant is pregnant? I was going to make a joke about that, seeing as you are from England and you've got an English sense of humor, but uh, I'm not going to say about the moods of elephant and how they can be a bit more difficult or anything like that. I just don't think it's, it's the correct answer in this case. So, more likely, you can tell that from a variety of other things, but it's actually very difficult, to be honest, Maureen. It's, uh, it's not something you can just see as easily, uh, even when they're far pregnant. I mean, even if they, you know, in their, in their third or fourth, or I don't know how many trimesters they have. <laughs> well, you have only three trimesters, but you know what I mean, how many parts through their pregnancy. Keep in mind, the gestation period is 22 months, almost two years. It's a long time. But they are so bulky that you don't really see that. And we discussed it this morning, actually, when we were looking at the breeding herd, there was a tiny calf with them. Elephant babies, or the calves, are about half the size relative to the body size of the adults or compared to human babies. So, if you think of a human, I've got very recent experience of that with um, my wife having been pregnant with our son. Um, by the end of it, it's very, very clear. You can't really miss it. But with elephants, it sort of just gets taken up in that great big bulk. So you would see it more from circumstances. So if you know her herd well, you will know that her other calf is now four or five years old. So it's time that she might be pregnant. Um, you might notice it if it was a female that you know well, that she wasn't lactating and suddenly she's starting to, to show swelling of the mammary glands. So those are things that you would notice. But it's not, it's not probably one of the most difficult animals to notice when they are pregnant. little guy, um, actually just the other day someone asked me it while we were driving from the, the camp back to the control area or the control center where all the magic happens. What is that secretion on the side of the head there? You can see there's a little wet spot between the ear and the eye. That's referred to as a temporal gland. Now sometimes people think that the temporal gland is only active with big bulls when they're in must. We'll discuss must again when we see a big bull like that but it's not the case. All elephants have temporal glands. It is often a case of not only of, but sometimes of stress or distress. I've also noticed quite often when it's quite hot, so obviously it's uh, not that comfortable for them, then it can uh, also be bothering them a bit. And you see that secretion, but it's, it's not, I mean this elephant, you can clearly see he's not stressed. He's been very aware of us, very comfortable with us. So much so that here I'm sitting, there's the Ellie. There, you can't see her now, you might see the movement of the bush. The mum is way over there, so she's so comfortable with our presence as well as her calf, that they're all just doing their thing and the calf is much closer to us than to her. And I like this kind of herd because they're sticking around, we can actually see them, I mean we've seen these guys pretty much on a daily basis. I'm wondering what we'll call that female, I'll, I'll ask the guides a bit if they have a name for her. Oh, let's have a look at him, he's going to have a bit of a sand bath. Or not, it looked like he was going to. Okay, no worries. <laughs> going to mum. Um, it's forgotten that mum had moved on. You know what, let's spend a little bit more time. I really like these jellies and I want to get to know them. They're going to be, if we're lucky, they might stick around for the next few weeks. If you're very lucky, you'll see them frequently over the next few months and really get to know them. I like the, the feeling we get to them. Here's the other one. Look at this. This is the teenager. going to give us a little mock charge there. That's something the youngsters do. When they get used to you and they get to know you, the vehicle, they do the same as what they do with other elephants in the group. And they sometimes just, when they're a bit boisterous, they come over, you know, try and give you a fright, practice their mock charge when they're big one day. But the point was just that we are going to get to know these ellies. So I'm going to show you one or two ways we can recognize it, other than the trunk. And maybe one or two suggestions of names. It's uh, always a tricky thing to ask for suggestions like that. But trunky or something like that is a possible possibility. Just look at this area, right on the ear there. You see that little thingy? That's one of the ways we can recognize it. That's a little notch on the ear from an old cut or something. 
And with elephants, that's always the easiest way to recognize them. Little folds and cuts. If you look further up the edge of the ear, if you just follow the ear along, there's another little groove. There's a small one, and there's a little square. I quite like that notch as well. Little square notch. Here's the youngster with his mum now. Say hello mom. I'm gonna come stand over with you now, but oh he's gonna have a drink, look at that. That's a definite clear sign that they're very comfortable with us. We are sitting eight or nine yards from them. Totally relaxed and comfortable with our presence. Now come on mum, I've had enough of the grass now. It's lovely. Now do notice he's suckling with his mouth and that's very nice to see. People don't, well firstly you don't see this all that often. Secondly people always think that they drink with their trunks, suckle with their trunks. Keep in mind that elephant's trunk is not like a straw, it is a nose. So even though they can suck water up in the trunk, they can't drink through the trunk. So they might suck water up and then blow it back into the mouth. But when the calves are suckling, Fold the trunk out the way like we can see very nicely there. Oh, that's beautiful. So glad we stuck around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love the way the trunk is really folded out the way. Look at that. Okay. Hey man, what's this thing doing in the way here? Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> okay, now what she's doing. As much as the calf wants the nice milk, She's moving that branch, that was a dead branch that was lying there. And often where you've got dead material lying, you can't, the other animals can't get to it. Or, or to what's underneath it. So that dead branch was protecting the grass. The grass is growing nicely because the impalas and other things weren't eating it. The elephant's big enough, she picks it up, throws it away, and then eats the, the food. There you can see, that's exactly that area that she's eating now. That's where that dead branch was lying down. It's just a little protected area. Give us some nice food. I don't think what you should call her. Unless there's a specific name, as I said, I will check with the guides, but I was sort of just for the sake of it said chunky just now but I was just thinking that little thing there on the side of her ear and it doesn't look like a key but somehow it made me think of a key and the trunk and a trunk and a key and then chunky because it's a small chunky not a full chunky I don't know maybe we go with chunky Also, the little one was drinking with these little chunky out of the way, so... Well, that would make more sense if you spoke Afrikaans. In Afrikaans, we have this thing where you can make objects smaller by adding IE to the back. So, an elephant, and then if you say an elephant key, it wouldn't make sense to most of you. But, uh, anyway, that sort of is why that name jumped into my mind looking at the small trunk. Well, let's sit for a little bit more. Let me just try and get my head out of the way. That side, eh? How's that? That seems better. Mm, I like these ellies. Very tranquil from them. Okay, 
catch that last thing or just a one and then letting me know something. There's good times for them now after the the long winter. Now keep in mind our winters, especially in the low flop, they're not severe in terms of cold temperatures. It's not like many of you in the northern hemisphere, Europe, America, Canada, would um have beautiful eye. I love elephant's eyes. You guys have got a lot of cold, harsh winters. Our winter is more harsh in the sense that it's very dry, no rain. No rain rain means not too much dry food. Or, or, or nice food is what I mean. Too many dry things to eat. So now that all the green stuff is coming out, the elephants really are enjoying it. All the animals, but the elephants especially. I like I was just looking at those thorn branches. That's what you're looking at, Brian. Mm. Yeah, it just looks lovely against the elephants, the texture of the skin. Yeah, great textures there, they're very sharp to find white thorns, that's from a little acacia tree against the ruffles of the elephant skin. Coincidentally, one of the reasons or various reasons for the skin being like that, obviously very thick skin, but also we spoke about the, the cooling down system. I explained a couple of days ago that you must keep in mind that these animals are very big and the bigger you get, the harder it is to get rid of body heat. So the quicker you build up body heat. If you think of a mouse, a mouse, the relative, this elephant is so comfortable with us. Look at how she's standing literally, I mean, she's right in front of us. That's how close we are. You can, I can grab her by the tail, you know. <laughs> really close to us. Totally relaxed with us. Here's the calf, there's mum, having a nice time with us, not bothered. There's lots of other green stuff they can eat. So sometimes, or quite often, it's the curiosity that makes them come closer as well. So she's deciding, well... I like that vehicle, they've been around, I'm a bit curious now, especially this one, we look a bit different from the normal game drive vehicles, we've got a cameraman sitting at the back, and uh, Brian, I mean Brian looks quite special in his own way, <laughs> we've got a little warthog tail sticking out the back for the antenna, and um, I also think because we tend to spend a bit more time, you know, we're not that rushed necessarily, not that the game drives are rushed, but you know what I mean, so they get time to get used to us, and then they get curious, they, and they're very intelligent animals, they want to know what's going on so she's hanging around a bit so quite often they decide well I'm going to eat that bush because it's close to that thing that I'm curious about I mean I've seen it lots with bulls where they eat and they slowly eat and eventually they're standing right next to you and they're still pretending to be eating but all they're doing is they just sort of messing with the grass and breaking some of it and letting it fall again they're not even eating anymore but they're still pretending to do it and they're standing with big eyes like this just looking down into the car which is um, really nice to to see coming back to the surface area so a mouse would have a lot of exposed skin area relative to the body size or to the body mass. So bones and meat compared to skin, a mouse would have a lot of area that they can get rid of heat with. The bigger you get, the less that exposed surface area is relative to the body mass. So having a lot of folds in your skin like this dramatically increases the size or the, or the um, area of the skin. And then also if they do have a mud bath, and they're spraying a bit of, let's see, she's going to come look at us, I think. She's turning around, does she not, maybe. And then, um, nice. Hello. Look at that, she's coming over now. This is awesome. This is what I was hoping would happen. What are you doing? And just to test us, we weren't worried. We just said to her, come. So again, she can see we're not bothering her. And it's not an aggressive thing. So many people think that the head shake is aggressive behavior. It really is not. It's just a little asking us 
what are you doing? And we will spend time with these Ellie's again. They've been around. I hope they'll stick around for a few days. We will come back to them if we see them. We will spend time with them. They will get used to the sound of the vehicle. They will get used to the sound of my voice. And uh, I hope that they can become one of our little curious characters over the next few few weeks, I assume, next few months. At the same time, speaking of curious, um, Aiden, HD as we call him, he's just found some vultures. Now, if you find a lot of vultures, that can often be quite interesting relative to what's going on. So, I think you might be enjoying that process of looking around. We're going to leave these Ellie's. There's another game drive. Let them enjoy this a bit. We're going to continue on to the west, and we'll see you back in a bit. Over again. Jump for a couple of the love you that Mafazi with a short trunk. Uh, just coming up. Well, you know, when you come into the African bush or any part of the world for that matter, you look for tracks and signs, you look for signals, and they're very important things for us to know what's going on. One of the most fantastic signals in the world, <laughs> particularly in this part of the world, is what's above our heads very at this very moment. Now, it's a little bit tricky to see, but I want you just to have a look up there. And Viam is just tracking one of those vultures. Vultures circling and soaring around in a circle and coming down to the ground like these ones are right now can normally mean there's something of quite, uh, quite a lot of interest for us over there. Um, I suppose what I'm trying to say is I think that there's been a kill of some description. They're coming right down to the ground. You can see them here, look. Look at this one. They're just circling, getting lower and lower. And there's loads and loads of them. So it's just beyond us here. I'm going to wait until these two pop down, these two vultures. They're, they're circling now and they're coming down about probably 200 metres, about 600, 700 feet from where we are. You can, I can just see them coming through and landing on the ground there. So what I'm going to do is just creep my way up and around. Vultures are very, very skittish. Uh, I don't want to disturb them, but I also don't want to disturb uh, what animals there. So my heart's racing. It always does when I see vultures. It could mean fantastic things. Uh, it could be an old bony carcass that hasn't, been, uh, hasn't got anything left on it and all the predators have gone. But at the same time, we've got signal. We've got uh, fantastic signals from the bush that there's something going on. One, two, three, four, five, loads more. Hold on, it's a bit bumpy here, guys. Wow, look at this. Now, down there, a bit further, I'll just stop the car so we're not, we're not bouncing. Even more vultures in the trees, and just to the left, there's a few more vultures, there's actually a pack tree of vultures just to the left of those ones. Even more just there, see them? We're going to move down a little bit closer. I'm going to be very, very slow at doing this and uh, let's just see what we can find. We might have to do a little bit of poking around here. Uh, I might have to go in different ways because I've got to come off the road and go through a little bit of scrubby vegetation there. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, keep our eyes out because these trees are quite favourable trees for the, the leopards. Uh, and keep our eyes open if there's a kill up in a tree and loads of... It could be anything, it could be anything. But there's a load of load of vultures here, a load of vultures over there too.
So, I'm sorry I haven't uh, spoken much. I've just been watching what's going on here. And there's, there's, there's vultures all around in these trees. They fly from one to the other, so don't think we're scaring them off. Uh, they are all, there's some flying overhead. There's loads in the trees behind us here. I just want to head up here a little bit further and please bear with me. Um, I'm going to have to just go in there very, very gently as uh, I don't know what it is. But it's very exciting. Just looking for the right access, right route to go in. Just watch yourself on that tree. Right, well welcome back quick change there from HT to us he's gonna look around for those vultures see what they're up to I just spoke to some of the game drives as well they're also gonna scratch around lots of vultures always mean potentially something for them to eat and that means something that killed whatever they're gonna eat but look at this and there and there you'll see them slowly now as we go on we've now come across a different type of elephant group sorry, Mr. sorry man. two left hands there I'm going to switch the car off so we're nice and quiet and out he comes. This is a big bull. Looks like about five or six of them. So I'm hoping there might be one really big guy here. Quite often you find... Oh, there he is, the big guy. Right there in the front. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Guys, this is... Hey, this is a pleasure. You refer to these guys as Ascaris. They are bulls that hang around with the bigger guy for company. Look at that one down the road. Just look at that. Yo. Yo, yo, yo. That is proper, proper awesome. Yeah, no, that's up there with as big as you'll ever see them. What a privilege to still have creatures like this moving around. Yo, big shake of the head. He'll be a good, probably six tons. I can see he's got a collar on. You see that uh, bump on his neck? That's a collar, so it means he's being tracked. That the guys doing elephant research are keeping an eye on him, partly because he's such a big tusker as well. So good to see that. He's got a, not only the scary bulls looking after him, this guy whose tail is in the front here. 
and also some people with the right intentions looking after him as well. I want to go have a look at him. This guy might not. Uh, okay, he's quite relaxed. I like the feeling of this group. There's also another big bull. Look at the guy on the left. Beautiful view there, sort of in towards the west. You can see the sun getting a bit lower already. Make no mistake, these other bulls are not small. They are still in there. This guy I would I would estimate to be in his probably at least mid 30s, maybe late 30s. All of them are nice and wet. They've had a nice uh, mud wallow or a mud bath somewhere in the back. There's a pool with some water in. Obviously, they get really warm. These big guys, so they love to have. Uh, a swim if they can or if there's no water to swim they'll just splash cooling mud on them but let's go look at that big guy eh? i really want to go see him that's that is such a rare privilege to see a big male like that not just a big male but a big tusker it's not so many of them anymore go back a hundred years or so there were lots of big tuskers around but in the early days of of ivory hunting and i'm not going to go into that subject too much now but a hundred years ago if i lived i would almost certainly have been some type of explorer and a hunter and explorer were very close together in those days and many of the early hunters or later hunters were the early guys that started pioneering various other forms like what we do these days ecotourism and so forth so but the point is in the early days a lot of the big tuskers were hunted for their tusks so genetically there's not as many of them around as as they used to be and then of course um, later on 50s 60s 60s 70s 80s when poaching became a big thing the big bulls were targeted first so unfortunately the genetic pool of big tuskers are less than they would have been some time ago look at that beautiful footpath he's walking down I always thought one day if i could have a lodge in this area i would call it Budula, which is a shanga name for these footpaths crisscrossing the whole bush water hole to water hole one area to the other grazing ground to grazing ground you get these footpaths often made by the big animals elephants and hippos and so forth Let's follow them. There's another water not so far from here. It looks like they might be heading there as well. We won't be able to follow them all the way through. Is that, is that him? Yo, 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 yo. Let's get onto one of these animal trails and we'll just follow that along. Here's another footpath. This is actually the one the elephant followed, I think. Now in the footsteps of a big tusker. Footsteps of giants. Yes, if you read the book. Look at the games I was know about this big guy as well. Okay, well, nice to see he's very relaxed. Yeah, I had to squeeze a little bit past him there to, to get around to this side. Mm. What a view! My goodness. Oh, it's certainly been a day for elephants. Sorry about that, Brian. Cool. The vehicle settled here. We're going to take a little seat here. Interesting as well, just as we came around now to look at this big guy, the Ascari bulls, these other bulls hanging around with him, have come a bit closer. What an elephant. Truly spectacular.
Jo, jo, jo. Uh, he's, a, he's a big boy. Yeah? Look, he's pulling that whole tree, and that's a, that's a decent sized tree that's been pushed over there. Okay, so I was just talking about these Ascaris. They've suddenly all come a bit closer. Still not too close. I mean, keep in mind, this elephant weighs six tons, maybe a bit more, maybe seven tons. It's not like it needs protection. Maybe from people, but uh, that's a different story. But these other guys are more for company. But the vehicle, and they just come a bit closer. They're just showing that, as a respect that we are here. If that guy harasses you, we'll be all over him. <laughs> and it literally is what they what they do. They they provide him with company. In return, they get to learn from him. Maybe he knows a few secret water holes or place where he will sweet. But also, will be easily accepted into breeding herds. So if there's a breeding herd where there's a female in East stress or a female. So cool, huh? Yeah. I was gonna, I was gonna, we're just gonna actually let's show quickly. He's not looking like he's in a rush. You can't see them that clearly, but they were all spread out, these other bulls. Now, as we've come in, here's the first one. There in front, there's one. And then there's one, there behind the bush. The other one is coming out there on the side. You can see the movement. There's the fourth one. Just as we came close to this guy, all four of them, just slowly, no major rush, busy eating, but all four of them came and sort of tightened the circle around this big guy. It's so nice to see that. You can also see the beautiful coloration. They're all very dark from the mud bath earlier. That will start drying off now. The sun is coming through bright and clear. The term Ascari, which is what you use to explain the, call it the entourage for this big guy. Oh, look at him, he's turning sideways a bit here comes from the Swahili word for, for guard or for safekeeper so that's where Ascari comes from How old do you reckon this one is? He would be Put him probably uh, 48, 50 maybe. I mean, he's still in very good condition. Maybe not that old even, 42, 45. Um, elephant bulls, they, they reach their sort of physical prime in their 40s. Depends a bit on how good the food quality is. Guys, just look at this again. So I know there's a lot to look at, but just look around us quickly. Just, just look around towards the left here. Just see what's happening here. Closer. Two more on this side. Look at that. We'll just come and say, hey, what are you doing with our big buddy? They also want some FaceTime. Yeah, that's my beard, eh? <laughs> They're like, come on, guys. I heard you call it the entourage. I want some FaceTime, too. Oh, here he's coming over. Look at this, guys. Now, keep in mind, elephants have got this amazing trick. They get bigger as they get closer. Oh, what a monster. Yo, 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 yo. That's a big bull. He would be, I was saying six tons earlier, he's bigger than that. He's probably seven tons. He's up there with as big as I've seen them. And I'm not just talking about the tusks, I'm looking at the bulk as well. Very tall at the shoulder, massive body. He's got that sort of the back and the hindquarters really filled in with muscle. Absolutely in his prime. He's not in must, interestingly enough. Discussed must earlier. Big bulls like that, when they're in the peak of their condition, they can sometimes be in must for up to six months or so a year. This guy is probably just taking a bit of a time out from that. See what this guy does, he might give us a little head shake just now, just to sort of test us same time they're so comfortable and so relaxed just keep in mind these guys are all bigger they all even this guy he's one of the smaller ones of the Ascari's. he needs to be a good four and a half tons 
Yeah, eight check coming, maybe, no. Maybe a little one. It's coming to have a look. Okay. Well, it's a bit reluctant, or with reluctance that I'm leaving them, but I think let's leave these guys very, very, very relaxed. Ground. Your hold was being massive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, a, a Brian is just big smiles on the back there. But um, that's that's something special to see, eh? Yeah. I'm sure for you guys as well. Uh, it's not every day that you that you see bulls of that size. What a treat! Suckling calves, massive hillies. What more do you want? Everything from small to big. Yeah. Humbling as well, eh? Yeah, very. I mean, that, he's like, we take everything, this car and everything on it, both of us, yeah. probably about four of that. You're looking at, you're looking at the same weight. And you could literally pick this car up. I mean, weight-wise, you could pick it up easily. Give it a solid center, of, center point to grab hold, and just pick it up and put it down there. Talk to the game drive stations out to the west. See if there's anything happening that side. Ground. Um, just for your update, uh, HD hasn't found anything so far, they're still looking around. And we're going to do the same. You know, movement's always nice when it's hot like this. As soon as we move, you sort of put the air conditioner on, so bring this down some. Uh, I'm going to drive through this area and then I want to head back into the area a bit later on. Around for some uh, some leopard. This is one of the main roads leading into South Sands Game Reserve. So it's someone from the Parks Board, from the Park Management.
where shall we where shall we start today? I'm having lots of fun at the moment just getting to know this new area. A lot of fun for me because to the right is Aretuza. That's the other area that we can traverse or that we can drive around and look around in. And in the past we never used this, so now uh, we now guided here, Juma as well, all that side. So suddenly it's a new area, new roads, new little drainage lines, new trees, a little bit of different wildlife sometimes, just different areas, a so different leopard and so on. Always nice to explore. Is something fantastic in exploring a new road. or actually being a little bit lost in a new area. It's very difficult to be lost. I, mean, I, I, I always, people have asked me, I go into Damaraland places in Namibia, that's, that's truly remote. I mean, people still get truly lost there, I mean, and, and, and worse. But uh, people go, aren't you afraid you'll get lost? And so you can't really be that lost. I mean, what is, what is the term lost? It's, it's more a sort of a mindset to be lost. I mean, you still know where you are. I mean, at the moment I'm in South Africa, so that's, that's a really good start. If I'm in Damara land, I know the area I'm in, and it doesn't matter finding a way out of there, but being a little bit lost is fun. That was knowing where you are relative to where you need to be, but not knowing exactly where you are. I like that feeling sometimes. It's called exploration. We here and I want to go down into this area. I want to go see this Marikini. Go there. Okay, I've got an idea. All right, I'm gonna go there. Second left. Stay left. Okay, I've got the plan. Okay. <laughs> no feeling my way around. sure you noticed this tree as we were driving up to it this is a dead lead wood one of the combretums I'm just looking at the amount of smaller branches that have already broken off this tree I would guess has been dead for at least oh, I don't know 20 30 40 years but more likely a hundred years something like that I'm actually gonna go close to you then uh, Brian oh you got Edward is that what you saw well yeah. done so I didn't did you see that did you see the lizard is that what you zoomed in on? There he is. Yeah, there he is. So I can't get oh, closer Let's, I'll take you closer. Wait, we'll sneak up. Shh. We'll go closer to the lizard. He's running around the branch, looking at where he can hide in the tree. Lizards live in trees because it gives them good safety from predators like eagles and mongooses, while also providing them a good place to bask in the sun. And hide from the wild earth crew. Wait for him. We will be patient until he shows himself again. Or something like There's another one. Can you see him or is he too far from you? Uh, where about? Uh, no, you won't see him. He's, uh, he's uh, to the right more. But look at this texture. That's actually why I wanted to come next to the tree because we've got some nice side life there. It reminds me a bit of that elephant skin. Mm. Now, what's amazing with these uh, leadwood trees is they can stand a big guy like this for about a thousand years after they have died. So for another thousand years after they have died, they provide homes. You see the other lizard, he's, uh, you got him there. Go into those two, the two holes. Yeah. There we go. And then a little bit down, a little bit down, small, small, down, down, down. There we go. And there he is. Just the head peeking out. Yeah. 
Just imagine that after you've lived for probably a thousand or so years to get to this size, these trees can then stick around, stay around in this form as a dead tree for up to another thousand years. And uh, that's amazing. Providing homes to lots of birds and lizards and all kinds of little things that live in them. actually a skink if you're more specific. I've never been a, a person to get, oh, 15 years ago, yes. I got into the details of every little skink and every little lizard and every little flower and every everything like that to, to try and name all of them. And that's a good thing. I'm not saying it's not a good thing, but over the years you spend a lot of time in the bush and you actually start to appreciate more just the understanding of it. In other words, understanding the sounds and the smells and the things that animals do. And you forget a few of the smaller things' names. Uh, and then you realize one day you don't actually mind if you do whether you know the name of the animal and I'm talking about the little things now it's not such a big deal it's more if you know the animal itself if you know the what they do how they do it that part I like a lot if anyone wants to check up on that if maybe you're really into reptiles and lizards and skinks and those kind of things if you can give a name I think now you get the three striped skink there's probably another one, I'm not sure. I didn't see three stripes, I only saw two. If someone wants to look into the detail and let us know what kind of skink that was, you're welcome. It'll be fun to know. We'll call it the Leadwood Living Skink. <laughs> they've got a cool house. They, they've got prime property. If I was a skink, I'd pay the big bucks to live in this tree. And your house is going to be here forever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and let's just look. I'm just going to take a photograph of it as well. but. Let's see what Brian can play with. This is such a, if you look up right at the sky, I'm not sure how far you can tilt back on that. It's quite a cool view and I've, I've done some of my favorite photographs shooting up on long trees like this just because you've such, got such a nice uh, contrast there with the trunk itself. cloud up there towards the west there's some more cloud we should have a nice sunset big blue sky Brian <laughs> do we smell properly <laughs> That's a bit of an alternative view to, to life around you in the bush. Cheers, lizards. I don't know how many lizards and skinks and little things live in this tree at any given moment. Let's have a last look. They're both just chilling there now. They've gotten used to us. Look at that. You see in the, in the vertical crack? Yeah. I'm say, at any given moment, but more interestingly, over the lifespan of this tree. Ah, no, they decided to go. Yeah. So over the hundreds of years that it's alive, and then the next hundreds of many, many hundreds of years when it's dead. So we're looking at a minimum of probably collectively 800 to 1,000 years, but maybe even as many as 2,000 years. animals that have lived in that tree over that time. Okay, let me just make sure. This one I know already. On the northern boundary of Arctic, just so I've actually driven these roads at least just to familiarize myself with the sort of the area that we can look around in.
tracks, but not that fresh. It looks more like last night, or maybe early this morning. But I see another track there. Let me just make sure I just glimpsed it. Sometimes I hear now leopard tracks can look a little bit similar, especially if it's soft sand. You know, if it's perfectly it's sort of perfect sand, then you can see the track clearly, you know, which one of the species. But if it's a bit soft sand, you know, after the track or the foot leaves the sand, the sand sort of trickles in a little bit. You just get the, the general poor shape. You don't necessarily see the detail. So it's a bunch of names. Bumpy side, sideway bumpy roads. One thing if you're bumping like this, but if you're bumping like this, it's different. Yeah. Oh, we do these sand dune tours in, the, in Namibia. We, we take people into the I mean, crazy big dunes. They're some of the biggest dunes. Well, not some of the biggest dunes of the world. And um, it's very smooth, so it's great driving. But you drive at these crazy angles sometimes. <laughs> and you go down in, in, in ridiculously steep faces and so on. But driving sideways. That's why it even feels more pronounced in the back there with where, where Brian's sitting. Since the car starts going sideways, it feels really odd. Even though the car actually can drive at quite a, at quite a steep degree on the side, but it just gets to the stage you really feel like you're going to fall over at any stage. Termite animal, the termite mount animal, they don't change so much. 
rock animal, that's also interesting, the boulder animal. They're quite exciting though when you first see them. Yeah, yeah, no, you have them and you're like, eh! And you're like, oh no man, it's one of those other animals. You're relevant five. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> you know, you get the big five. I don't know if you can always, yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't. So, I'm just uh, thinking of what H is up to. I might not be able to get back in the vehicle with him for a bit. He's just uh, looking around an area that we can't get to at the moment from a signal point of view. But, um, what Brian was saying, I don't know if you can always hear him in the back, but uh, you know, you get the big five, very, very famous, you know, huge part of African marketing, um, but obviously for the right reasons. Then you get the small five. And then we've got the irrelevant five. And let's just classify that or clarify that. It's the, it's the, the, the rock, rock animal, the termite bound stick. animal, the tricky stick, the tricky stick animal, the log animal, and the clump of grass, and the clump of grass animal. <laughs> it's the irrelevant five. But they can be at their own time quite special as well. <laughs> yeah, at first, very exciting. Very, very. Very exciting. Just make sure I am where I think I am. But I'm pretty sure I am where I think I am. Yes, I am where I think I am. I'm very excited about it because we've got signal so far. On our previous test, we were struggling here. So, whatever the smart people are doing, that would be people like Graham and Will. They, uh, they're tweaking this for us, giving us more range. Saying, please take. One of the best game drive vehicles in the world gets it up to perfection and go look for animals. Which is probably the best words I can hear from anyone outside of my immediate family. And uh, for what it's worth, guys, it's we weren't doing so well here a couple of days ago, signal wise. So, this is very cool. And we are driving down my favorite road in the whole world, right here, right here. Because I've never driven here before. And by that very definition, it's my favorite road. If it then happens to be in a beautiful drainage line like this, with trees everywhere, leopard that can pop out any minute, buffalo, elephant, lion. It might not look like it, but I'm a very happy man right now. And thank you for being part of that. Without you here, and I mean you, None of us are doing this. a little bit in sort of like sort of silly happy mood sorry we'll just repeat that again please sorry we'll just letting you know something there to take note of Right there, Brian. Yeah. Stop you quickly. Sorry, Brian's just tweaking the. We went through some thick bushes that were just sort of overhead, and as I said, we've got this little warthog tail at the back, which is. No, it's in the beginning, I used to always think that it's sending us out to you, but more and more, and, and this is. No jokes. I think of that now as the thing that brings you here. Because it really is what it is. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not coming to you. And, this game drive is not coming to you wherever you are. You're coming to us where you, you, where you are. You're choosing to spend your time in Africa on a game drive. So I'm thinking more and more of all these things, all the, the bits of equipment and technology that makes it possible as the gear that brings you here. So Brian was just tweaking the antenna that brings you here. I like 
like this road, eh? Mm. Really likey likey. Big jackalberry trees all over here. This whole area just whispers. Leopard. And it screams leopard. Out of that donga, donga is that sort of drainage line. Somewhere down the line, you might be following something. So that's a good way out. You know, it's probably worth maybe a few weeks ago. Well, let's follow it quickly. Normally, when you find a track like this, it's a uh, Big kill in there, so maybe a green. The tracks are still going along, but it's sort of becoming less and less, so I'm not going to keep following it. It looks like there was something going on, but it's not recent. Maybe two weeks, three weeks ago, so anyway, that's probably what it was. I don't need to keep driving along the track until it stops and runs out. Let's get back in the donga. Marakeni donga. Cool vehicle to go on about it, but we just drove through a hole there that most 4x4s would stop for and reconsider. And it almost felt like it. I drove through it, I don't know if you felt it right, but I drove through it and it was like, how did that not feel like it was deep? Yeah, as deep I as it looks. I was expecting a lot more of a, a drop. Yeah, it's just like cool, cool. It's lovely to hear. You know, it's nice just to have people sometimes just join the conversation. In other words, obviously we like the questions. Keep in mind, if you have questions, you can email them to questions at wildearth.tv. Or you can tweet us, which is what Patty Walters did. She tweeted us and uh, said uh, she's loving the banter between Brian and Peter. Brian. Yeah, there you go. Brian also talks with his thumb. And um, 
You can tweet us at hashtag Safari Live. If you have something to ask or to mention or to say hello, just. Brian, uh, I've only got to know Brian a few days back. We were in our Thursday. About five days ago. Tall guy. I'll, uh, I'll tell you more about it at some stage. And I think we should get the guys at some stage or another, get the guys around the fire and just find out a little bit more about them. But he's a tall boy. Not really a boy. He looks like a boy, Brian. You look about 24. Yeah, thank you. And he's 28. Um, I'm not going to say much more than that. I might make you blush. <laughs> I think the ladies won't mind seeing Brian. Let's put it that way. Amongst many other such things, he worked as a trapeze artist. I can only imagine, I just had this vision of him in a leotard. So I'm sure that's what trapeze artists wear, isn't yes, it? Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and he was the catcher, so he was the guy swinging around up and catching the people. So, um, so I can safely say that I think I trust Brian. Oh, this is a nice tree, yeah? Hey, this is a big jackalberry. Really big jackalberry. I'm just give an idea of the, the size of this tree. I'm just going to walk over the stand against the trunk just to give you some perspective. And then I'm seeing something up there as well that's interesting. But don't worry, it's not a leopard or something, it's just something non live or non alive. We are live. I'm looking. Follow up where the, where the bark is off the trunk. Oh, there? Yeah. Yeah, got that. That's why I was so careful looking into that trunk because uh, that's not a very old skin. That was shed, I would say, probably in the last couple of weeks. Not a very big snake, but not necessarily need to be a big snake to be a one you don't, don't want to bump into. I would guess probably a boomslang. Boomslang directly translated, that's the name. But the, it comes from an Afrikaans name, which means a tree snake. Not aggressive snakes at all, in fact, quite shy. Beautiful snakes, highly venomous. But they don't really bite that often. That's a spectacular tree. Oh, sorry, I just got my comma tangled up. Let's look at that. Given enough time, we will see dappled thing lurking up in those branches. This is a nice tree. It's got a termite mount at the back of it, so it's got a quick access up the back. It'd be a good place for a leopard to take a nap in. I'm sure over the years this tree is many, many years old. This tree has had many leopards sleep in its branches over the years. I can be very sure of that. Sun getting a bit lower, getting that lovely late afternoon softness to everything I love this time. Time now, eh? Oh, the big projects up there. Two different projects. This one is his favorite. Okay. <laughs> it's very exciting, this one, guys. Let me just give you a little bit of background to what we're actually doing. Maybe you've just joined us. I'm getting the feeling that there's more and more new people on the vehicle with us. Uh, of course, those of you that have joined us for many years, you know, that, that have put it this way, that have known Karula since she had her first cubs since the early days of looking around this area. Um, we are busy with effectively with rehearsals, but true wild in style. We thought we might as well do it live and have you along for the ride. We are testing equipment, seeing how far we can go. We're very excited about this step forward today. Graham and uh, Will, I'm sure, 
very excited about it, as we all are. So just stretching our muscles a little bit and stretching our area a bit. And it's, it's no mean feat to do this. This is happening right now. Okay, I should have noticed. This is now. And we're doing last stories to see what we see. That's many, many different in the, in, in the low felt area or part of the Greater Caribbean National Park. It's one of the best areas in the world for experiencing African game, especially big game, especially the cats. And uh, many people come here for that. It is a very, very amazing experience, something that you are very privileged to do. And what Wild Earth would like to do is to show this and share this with many people in a new way, which is what we're doing right at this moment. And National Geographic, who is, uh, you know, it's, it, as a group or as an uh, uh, entity, is one of my years. I don't think any of us grew up thinking that I don't like National Geographic. I, don't, you know, I was fascinated by it since the first time I saw some of the magazines and some of the pictures, and I was lucky enough to have worked with various guys for that year over the years. And they said, we're going to do this. We're going to going to share this with you. We're going to get it out there. We're going to use our network to get people to look at it. And I really would like to. I was talking the other day. I'm going to get to that in a second. But So this is building up to Big Cat Week, end of November, beginning December. We are going to, um, to do this live on the TV channel as well in North America and other areas too, as well as the website. Yeah, just a bit further. So this is all a big push for sharing this amazing world And I don't want to go into too much stuff. It's been something we've been talking about, whispering about a little bit. It's, uh, I'll tell you in a second. Let me just go see where I am. Okay, Barakini Donga, and we're going to go that way. Okay. Right and left. Um, we were saying the other day that it would be quite amazing to say or to do something. Now, all of us that are sitting here, I'm sure at least are mildly interested wildlife and wilderness areas but I'm sure all of us are actually very interested all of us have something in us in our hearts that feel good when we see the wilderness when we see nature at its best and we're saying why don't we aim for something maybe during Big Cat Week that could be a great time for maybe for the last day of Big Cat Week to see if we can't have the most people ever share in a real experience of a big cat and I would have to say it has to be a leopard this is Sabi Sands this is this is what you do Imagine we all got together and we all worked together and we let all our friends know and we let everyone know that uh, we're going to get as many people as possible to look at this cat, to share this moment. Hopefully it could be Karula, a peaceful leopard, she's stunning. But maybe talk to a few friends, Facebook a little bit, tweet a little bit, mention it to the guys at work, let them have a look at this. And then we aim for something in December where we get like a mess like a like a flash mob for wildlife we also this is for leopards this is for wildlife this is for Africa this is for that little piece in our hearts that uh, inspire us to look at nature and smile because it's beautiful don't you think that'll be cool if we can get like a million people to share that moment even cooler would be if we could get like a billion people to share that moment and say we are all here because we like this and uh, I just think that would be awesome. I really think that would be something fun. Maybe you think so too. Maybe you can talk to a few people. I'm going to bring this up every now and again. And I think that's what we should do. Let's let's try and create a moment towards the end of Big Cat Week. Where we try and get millions of people to share in a single moment with a beautiful piece of wildlife. With a beautiful moment out in nature. Speaking of that, there's another animal that is beautiful. Maybe in a less conventional way. That comes to mind when you see a big buffalo bull. Lovely sky there. Let's go sit with them a bit. A couple of big boys, we call them Dugger boys. They've also been mud wallowing to cool down. A little bit of energy there from that guy. He's a bit of a younger bull. He's just hanging out with the big boys. Sure, there's a couple of monsters here. Huh? Mm -hmm. One further back there to the left. Sorry, Alex, I didn't quite catch the question from Natalie there. If you want to repeat it again, please. Oh, 
got six or seven bulls here, all big guys. Stations, if anyone's interested, uh, nice little group of Dagger boys on 7th Road, just uh, close to the junction or the turn of from Marikini Donga. Natalie was asking, Natalie's from California, why was that tree that we looked at further back called a jackalberry tree? Well, Natalie, they make these lovely berries. That uh, it's a favorite with many animals, uh, birds, I mean the green pigeons and grey lurries and lots of birds like eating them, monkeys, baboons. But also when those berries fall down to the ground, excuse me, when they fall down to the ground, lots of animals will eat them off the, off the floor of off the area underneath the tree. Uh, Daker is one of the animals, this little antelope. Um, Kudu, Nyala, they also like it. And then jackals. Jackals are very much like foxes. People uh, always think jackals only eat scavengers or, or are only scavengers. In other words, that's where they see them normally when they see them out in the wild or documentaries. They're always with hyenas scavenging away. But jackals are actually great little survivors. Scavenging is like a bonus. It's like a little bit of a you know, just an opportunity for them. They, they catch all kinds of little things and eat insects, and basically vertebrates and invertebrates. So all the little things they will catch bigger things if the opportunity is there but they also eat non-animal things so I was going to try all the, use all the big terms and sometimes I feel like I really shouldn't use all the big terms carnivores and herbivores and all that kind of stuff but um, they are omnivores so they eat the whole lot like us like most of us actually people are the only species I know of that vary I mean you get the whole mixture most of us are omnivores but you get the vegetarians and of course then we can go into the detailed things of only this and only that but most species of animals have got a very specific diet relative to the niche relative to the availability of food and jackals eat everything and i presume whoever was the guy that gave the name to jackalberry tree might have been in a different language he called the same in afrikaans as well you must have seen jackals eating the bread and said hey that's a jackalberry tree all right i I know where I am, I'm going to turn around and go take another road that I haven't driven before. This is where we saw that big herd of elephants this morning. With a little baby, that guy was about two months old. He was very interesting to see. Cute baby is a better word. Times, but this area burnt not so long ago. It's been a little bit of rain since, not much, but you always get a green flush after the fire. And that's obviously good food for your herbivores, your plant eaters, or your, especially your grass eaters. And that's the buffalo, oh, they are bulk grazers. They eat grass, but at sort of a relatively non discriminate way. So they will eat all kinds of grass. You get your specialized grazers, things like some of your smaller antelope, they eat only specific parts of the grass or the, the, the better tasting bits and pieces. But these guys, the buffalo, they need to, oh, there's another one, they need to get the, the volumes in. And they are also ruminants, not to go too much into the technical stuff, but ruminants, things like buffalo, uh, giraffe are ruminants, most of your antelopes, uh, cows for that matter, sheep, uh, animals with different compartments to the stomach. During the day, they spend a lot of time eating, meaning sort of harvesting, walking along, eating the grass, giving it a few chews and swallowing it. But they fill that room in that first part of the stomach, 
during different parts of the day when they rest a little bit, maybe during the midday when it's hot to lie in the shade. They'll regurgitate that food where it's been lying in the stomach and, uh, and then chew it again. It's called ruminating or ruminating. And they chew it again and they chew it really fine and that allows them to digest cellulose because they really break the structure of the, of the grass and they really grind it fine. They can digest the cellulose very well and get the benefit from it or the proteins and so forth from it, mainly the proteins. I'm very glad I'm not a buffalo in that sense. A lot of time as well. They have to spend a huge amount of time doing this. So they spend most of their lives just eating grass, chilling out, chewing it again, swallowing it, chewing it again, and so forth. It works for them. But I'm very happy to be a, a omnivore. There's so many great foods in the world. I love good food. Who likes food? I know that's one of the common sort of topics to chat about when it gets quiet on the drive. Actually, all around. You know, you talk about the weather or the food. I love food. My wife's an amazing cook. I like cooking as well, actually. HT actually is quite a good cook as well. I know he's done some shows and things where he, uh, he actually does some fireside cooking. I think we should uh, at least at the camp get him to do a meal for us one. I'll help him. I love brying. Brying is a sort of colloquial name for, a colloquial word for uh, barbecue. I went like, I know where I am. I don't know where I am. <laughs> I know where I am, but you know what I mean. I wasn't where I thought I was. Let me just uh, use a bit of technology. Yeah? We've got this great, um, I want to say, gift. This really cool thing from uh, Mike from Juma helping us out. And uh, I can tell me exactly where I am. I think, yeah, red bolt hornbill. Okay. how the brain works because looking at the map which I've obviously been doing quite a lot as you say as you can see to keep myself relative to where I am I knew where I was and I knew I wasn't where I thought where I was when I got to the top there if you don't keep up with that type of thinking yet I got up there I saw an area that looks what I must admit it looks extremely like the, the next junction it's, it's exactly the same junction you come through a drainage line up the hill and then there's a couple of knobthorn trees and there's a square junction like that which is the boundary you can take left or right. It looks exactly like where we were this morning with the elephants and my brain just said to me hey you know where you are even though minutes before I was looking on the map knowing I'm somewhere else than where I thought I was. So all of that just now is just, just taught me a lesson again about how the brain works or doesn't work depending on how you look at it. So because I was thinking of food Stomach day, I always start thinking of food. Now I know where I am. Are you sure? I'm sure. This is a Marrakeni Dong. We're going that way, up towards that beautiful jackalberry tree. And we are going through it. And we go down this way. And then we take the wind ball direction. Then we're going to go 
through the donga and up the hill and we're going to get to a place where you will see it. It's just like where we just were. <laughs> Onto the trees. And then I'll go. And then I'll know where I am and be in the same place. It's quite easy to be confused if you try and burn it like that. So we're going to avoid the heavy rains. But I, I think for now we're right. It's not looking like it's that heavy. Maybe later tonight. Enjoy the drive with Hayden, you can enjoy it for a bit again. We're going to keep looking around and see if we can figure out where we are. Yeah, a bit of water down there, huh? Yeah. Doesn't look very tasty, but it's good to know. I wouldn't take a dip in that. No. <laughs> That uh, culture uh, interest that I was a pilot. Of. Uh, I moved on. We'll come back to you. I might get back to that another day. Uh, just cruising around an area here to try and see uh, our famous leopard quarantine and uh, or fork in the road. I should have asked you which way to go. Next fork in the road I come to, that I need the decision, I'll ask you, and you can tweet and let me know. So, uh, the temperature's dropped. It feels uh, beautiful at the moment. It's definitely a uh, good time for, and temperature for uh, predators to become more active. We say that pretty much every day to you, but that is one of the things that is inbuilt into our heads is that uh, when the temperature gets to the right level then we switch our tact and start looking for cats uh, because they'll be more active. We always come across uh, big cats that are resting but it's always great to see them on the move as well. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of a heads up as well. When we go through these little these drainage, what we call drainage lines or, or uh, little areas there that are, uh, are dry riverbeds really we may lose you, and that's just because of the topography and the vegetation and things like that. So if you're okay with that, then uh, that's fantastic. But we, I just want to give you the heads up uh, straight ahead. There's a couple of points that we do know. It changes a little bit, um, but please bear with us. But it's absolutely fantastic to have you on board. I missed you. I felt like I've been gone for a long time, but I know people... We've got you for another hour. The three cats in this area are looking for or learning mostly is Karula, mother of Shadow and Now I haven't. Not a little bit, but you know, I stop at loads of other things as well. It's really important, as I always say, to interact with the environment and the habitat. But uh, I really like the thought of tracking leopard or finding leopard uh, if we possibly can. So we've seen we had three sightings in the last sort of three days, which is fantastic. And uh, the animals on these reserves, as I always say, are really familiar with the word we call in conservation. Uh, particularly in context of tourism is called an habituation process. I've dedicated people to uh, really make sure that the animals uh, get used to slowly, slowly, bit by bit, get used to uh, vehicles and stay in the 
vehicles are going to be a threat or uh, going to harm them, and then the animals become very, very and okay with you being around. So that's always a good thing. Some animals are more flighty and skittish than others. Uh, I've worked in some parts of Africa where all just run straight away. As soon as they saw a vehicle, they'd run. Uh, and I've worked in places like this where it's a complete opposite. And that is a fantastic thing. We've got some animals, I think they're Nyala walking across the road up here. We've seen a lot of Nyala, but they're always beautiful to stop at and just have a quick look. Uh, A bit and you know, you don't force it, just it's not very natural, which is what I like. You must just find out from that side. Well, actually, you might even know yourself. Um, Start and end your day on safari. Every day, twice a day through January 31st, join a real African safari live online. Come face to face with lions. Leopard. Cheetah. So I'm rolling around there already. In the past, obviously, now it's hard. But we will see some nice things here as well. Before the end of the next few months, this will have water in it. We're going to continue on. Still on a road that I haven't driven before. Just through that jungle. The other one. When we turned around.
but everything seems good. Obviously, the So, no one home at the hyena, hyena household. Uh, we are just going to now cruise up to a place that we call in Parlour Plains. Um, some really nice open area where we did know that Shadow was uh, sort of hanging around yesterday and it's always good to go back up. The animals uh, do move all over the place and Shadow and uh, Quarantine are both establishing uh, new t territories at the moment, which is having a little bit of pressure on Karula from what we hear and, and see. So, it's all very interesting at the moment with the with the leopard. And as I've said to you, if you've just joined us now, or you've just joined us now, the most, uh, sunset, it's the most uh, thank you for your support and being being with us on the vehicle. And also uh, understand that sometimes we have dropouts through lots of different uh, terrain here. Coming down into these little gullies or these little uh, stream, uh, dry river beds, which we, which we call drainage lines, as I've said many a time, we will have the odd that drops out. Uh, we do our best. That's Start and end your day on safari. Every day, twice a day through January. One of the things I really want to share. Start and end your day on safari. Every day, twice a day through January 31st, join a real African safari live online. Come face to face with lions. Leopard. Cheetah Elephant Okay, well, welcome back. Sorry about that. Uh, there's lots of contributing factors with broadcasting live from this sort of wild, wild place where we are. And the weather can affect it as well. We are expecting rain. We can see right across here. We'll just stop for you. That sort of looks like a little bit of uh, interesting weather for us. The rains are on their way. We know that. Uh, Leopard. We're back. Uh, I was just saying that we are expecting rain, and that can play a huge, uh, be a huge contributing factor to our transmission and uh, our broadcast. So 
all I'm doing is explaining to everyone that we um, we know that there's there's hiccups and we know that there's dropouts and uh, that can be really for us. But thank you for sticking with us because really we really want to bring you as much as we possibly can from these beautiful reserves in South Africa here. And uh, this is one of the most exciting projects I've ever worked on. So to have you all with us uh, means a lot to us. I really really do. One little did get before was uh, the guy in the control room told me uh, in tweeting Start and end your day on safari You'll Probably see why with all the animals that we see here uh, but thank you very much for your time A really interesting area just here. We're going to get a flush of rain, oh sorry, a, a down rain probably either in the next few hours. This area here that's been burnt out in the last few weeks or maybe three or four weeks is going to have a big. The biggest news for me, oh, watch my aerial. Sorry, I look up like that all the time. My aerial sits four feet up in the sky. Start and end your day on safari. Every day, twice a day through January 31st, Join a real African safari live online. Come face to face with lions. Leopard. Cheetah. Elephant. and many other species. Or, well, potentially, we're going to see Shadow last night. It's great leopard country through here. Nice, lots of cover. Uh, lots of animals through here, like Nyala, and uh, even Bushbuck, a young Kudu maybe, but loads of different uh, species through here and I'm just keeping my eyes open always and we always look on the road as well for tracks or, or, or spore which is uh, the Afrikaans word for tracks and signs uh, it's a really important word that's used a lot in tracking and a lot in wildlife uh, by guides and by trackers and conservation workers uh, it, it really is a, a great word so if you hear me refer to spore it's spelled S-P-O-O-R and means tracks and signs of animals, not just the physical track, but it could be uh, the feces, the, the droppings, uh, it could be some fur or hair left on, a, on the side of a tree or something like that. Uh, so we might use that word a bit, just so you know what we mean. It's been a little bit quiet today, and I do always say to people, um, and I think
what do you see, mate? I can't see from here, mate. Ah, <laughs> right. Full moon. <laughs> okay. The moon is just rising. The sun has just gone down. <laughs> okay. Right. Here I am thinking, uh, I'm like, what is it? And he's going, I'm going, what is it? And I'm like, what? Full what? And I'm looking over there, and he said, full moon. Right. Okay. It's a little bit like a tree stump, but prettier. Tree stumps always jump themselves, jump out of the, the landscape to you as an animal at the right time of the day when you're really looking for something. So we touched on a few birds today. Uh, we had a look at uh, just a couple a day. I think it's really nice to learn and I'll, I'll try and throw a few more at you tomorrow. Uh, the calls or the bird calls are really important. They are quintessential sounds of Africa. And if I can sort of not teach you a few calls, but make help you recognize a few calls, you'll start to know uh, sort of things that we look for or listen for. And I'm just gonna see, there's a couple of birds over there. Uh, they're probably gonna fly off. They just did fly off. Um, We'll see them again. A couple of birds called grey lowries that I want to talk to you about. It's quietened down a little bit, but we will talk about birds because I said that they're a really important uh, part of the, the safari and the calls. You know, it could be a guinea fowl. Simple birds, fantastic looking birds, but birds that we see a lot and common that really quintessential African sounds. Uh, hammer cop, uh, crowned plovers that go in, in the call during the night and during the day, um, guinea fowl, uh, different different doves and you know we'll, we'll talk about them. It's really nice to have up, up your sleeve some bird calls and understand where they fit in. I get into the last hour of drive and I always think to myself, come on, okay, come on big cats, come on. If you do want to contact us, always, you can send us an email uh, at questions at wildearth.tv and you can tweet us at hashtag safari live and we get to as many questions as we possibly can. Uh, and your questions have been absolutely fantastic. Uh, some really, really good questions. Oh, that's, no. I'm just going to scoot down this road. It's a bit bumpy down here, I do apologize. listen for calls, alarm calls from different animals, different birds and antelope. If we hear that, we know that it's potentially a, a predator. Temperature is absolutely perfect at the moment. So I'm just going to toodle along here and then we're going to drop down uh, just below. There. look off there in the distance I just want to say, show you something that is really one of the most African, magical African scenes you can just see it <coughs> oh, excuse me I'll get VM to just zoom in to come above the road and you start to get that beautiful haze over on the horizon there that is just at this time of the night and it's one of those things that takes your breath away you start to see these views that go on for ever and ever and ever and you get this beautiful sort of bluish haze after the sun goes down and for me that is like that quintessential African 
vista that uh, I get really, I don't know, passionate about, waxing lyrically about. It's just something special about it. You get a really beautiful, beautiful feel about being here. It's a great place. Okay, we might uh, carry on. It's just nice to stop and have a breather and just have a listen and have a look. So, excuse me. Drop my keys. One of the things I think is really important is just to stop. <laughs> Stop and be and listen. That atmosphere. Really good stuff. Part of Africa. Look at that moon. Oh yeah. I think I'm gonna get a better shot for you, VM. Hold on guys, it's a little bit uh A little bit bumpy. Just coming up to this uh, little crest here over the area we call quarantine, and uh, uh, you're going to get an absolutely spectacular view of the full moon. And I'm sorry I'm sounding a little bit, well, no, I'm not sorry. Uh, I am sounding a little bit romantic and a bit sort of passionate and waxing lyrically, as I just said before then. But, you know, this is all part of being in Africa. And, and sorry, a bit bumpy there. <laughs> That's also part of being in Africa. Uh, have a look at that. Now that is what it's all about. Isn't that a beautiful view? That's one of those things that, when I was a lad, I used to see, there was this great, uh, I just got a message through, I'll come back to what I was about to say. I just got a message through from Pam in Phoenix. And Pam, if you're listening, I think you are, obviously you are, because you just sent us a, a message uh, to thank me for my passion and enthusiasm. Well, Pam, it comes naturally, and thank you for the, the the kind words. It's um, it's a really weird thing. Uh, I was born in Australia, and I used to I grew up watching these documentaries. And one of the documentaries was a a, a man uh, by the name of Marlon Perkins. There was an American program called uh, Omaha Omaha Mutuals uh, Wild Kingdom or something. I can't remember what it was called, but anyway, I think it was called Wild Kingdom. But that guy always. Uh, just enthused me in, in wanting to go to Africa. There's loads of other presenters as well that always, you know, make you just want to get on a plane and go. But I think the thing about being here and seeing that sort of thing 
is that uh, it really takes you back to these fundamental core principles in life. And that's that we are bombarded constantly with noise and, and information. We're bombarded with information all the time. And it's fantastic. We're very, very lucky to be living in this day and age. But wow, what a breath of fresh air when you can come somewhere and just take a chill pill. <laughs> just chill out for a bit. And uh, we've got technology all around us here. We wouldn't be broadcasting this live to you if we didn't have the technology. But the silence Right, well, I think enough talking and more driving and more looking and more searching and more positive thoughts for something with whiskers. Exactly right, but I just cut him off. Uh, rain and what animals do in the rain, and it's a very, very good question. Uh, she wants to know whether they prepare and start to bed down and find areas uh, to protect themselves. Well, strictly speaking, no, uh, but you will get some birds that might find uh, uh, some areas of shelter. You might get some uh, small mammals that might find some areas of shelter as well. Giraffes, for example, uh, or elephant, they can't really find shelter. Uh, elephant really do love the rain, and you know, I've seen some spectacular uh, fun happening with elephant in the rain. Uh, animals, it is really quite, quite amusing to see some animals, uh, particularly lions, and they sit there and they blink. But you know, do sort of uh, wattle on the sides of the boat. Go around a little bit closer and see, because they're moving off and you, it's a bit harder for us to give you that. But there's a great call, and <laughs> as soon as I said I'm gonna go around a bit closer, but they, uh, they, they run off. I'll come up to them a little bit. They'll stay there for a bit. I'm just going to show you them a little bit closer and then we'll let them be. But I'm going to come off the road because they're, they're on a mission. They're <laughs> they're on their way down the road there, which is quite funny. Uh, let me just stop down the side of them here. So excuse me, it's a little bit bumpy at the moment. It's like herding guinea fowl. I'm just going to stop here because then they'll wonder what I'm up to. We'll just see them go past here. They'll probably stop. I'll just stop here. And you can see them. They're cute little things. They're funny little guys. And they're on their way to find a roosting site now. And they'll probably all fly up into a tree and uh, make sure they get themselves protected in a good spot. If you have a look at this uh, this guide here that I've got down here in front of me, you get a little bit better uh, an idea. Uh, you saw that this is the adult version of them, and you've got a really lovely speckle to the bird, and that bony cask on the head, the males is bigger than the females, and this is the noise they make, and it's a quintessential African call. Those calls are really, <laughs> every time I hear that call, I think of Africa, whether I'm in some part of the world that has guinea fowl, they're all over the world, people have them, but they're indigenous or endemic to, uh, sorry, indigenous to, uh, to Africa. And they're, they're great, they're funny little birds, they really are. Okay, we're gonna cruise on down now. We've got about uh, 35 minutes to go, see what we find. I'm not sure what Pete's up to, but um, if we do hear of him getting, 
Okay, we are going to go to Pete. He's got some buffalo. A little bit more impressive than my guinea fowl. <laughs> anyway, we're going to go to Pete with his buffalo. And if I see anything down here with his leopard or if I spot anything, I'll be right back to you. Have a great one. Welcome back this side. I hope you enjoyed the guinea fowl. We're in that very magic time of the evening. We actually saw something just around the corner, but before we show you that something, that's quite crazy, that disappeared. But we'll find them again, but look at this first. I'm sure many of you, like me and Brian on the vehicle, like seeing the full moon rise. You know what, actually, let me tell you, I'm, I'm a bit rusty. Let's, let's show you how it rises. Let's move a little bit. And then what we found around the corner will be there still. It's a, a lot of them, so we will find it again. Let's get a little close up on these leaves. Let's just play a little bit with different angles. We have to get three things in line. Brian's view and your view, the moon, and some nice leaves. Let's see if we can achieve that. Notice how fast the moon is actually rising. Use a different kind again. This is the Transvaal Silver Cluster Leaf. The one further away to. I think it's tonight. I was sort of thinking tomorrow earlier when we discussed it, but for the same Of course, the exact time of very relative to where you might be in the world. So whether you see it or not. But actually not that. I should thought of it this way around. There is actually an exact time when the moon is full. In other words, when it is exactly in line with the sun and the moon. So this is the sun, here's the earth, here's the moon. There's a time when that is exactly in line. We don't necessarily see it from where we are. We obviously see full moon at the rise or at the set of sun. Of we see full moon at the sunset because that's when we see it. But there is only a specific time when the moon is actually at its Mathematically, you will agree. I think many of you, Brian, would you agree? I agree. Now, I'm wondering when that time is. It would be nice to see them crossing the road. Big ball that Makulu Madol. These guys normally settle down not too long after dark. Although we've got a full moon tonight. <laughs> for tomorrow night, tonight and tomorrow night, because the moon is shining bright mm. <laughs> on this Thursday night. And I just might uh, have another word that rhymes. 
to be honest. You'd say, oh, they're good to have you. As I said, I mean, jokes aside, with this, what? We're going to just creep around this area, see what we can find. It really is the luck of the draw, and it's just about constantly covering ground when you're looking for the predators and taking time and being nice and calm, nice and slow, and looking everywhere. And I'm lucky, I've got another set of eyes on the back of the vehicle. Uh, VM is with me. I've got to watch my aerial on these trees when I go underneath. But I'm looking up at that. We've got a lot of technology on this vehicle, and uh, it feels like you're driving something out of James Bond sometimes. Uh, <laughs> it does feel fantastic to These are the ultimate safari vehicles for us. I'm going really, really slow now. Oh, the moon is getting better. Thank you very The next meeting up particularly to big week on Nat Geo and you to stick with it board and uh, uh, the feedback is just here it is where you are or something in the afternoon twenty twenty nine degrees after It's 84 Fahrenheit, I think that is. Please let us know. I may lose you just down here, but stick with me. Welcome back to the site. So, a little bit of a few bits and bobs uh, happening on the control side. We're back for now, and we're moving along. It's actually just a nice drive. It's a nice, cool breeze blowing. The big moon sitting up there. And as always, at this time of night, you're looking for nocturnal things: leopard, lion, jackal smaller secretive ones that you don't see very often serval, genet, caracal, african wildcat, pangolin oh, it's a little things to be seen bush babies, they fun to see tricky to watch but fun to see I've never seen one never ever ever? not in the wild no. okay, you've seen them you I've know seen a photo, yeah. yeah yeah, but in the wild they are just they're one of those little things Brian just saying he's never seen them sort of in real life and uh, the photo don't do them justice eh? They are beyond cute. Try for a bush baby then. I was just thinking that's um, 
try to spot one. Right, well, uh, I think uh, HD might have something but bigger than a bush baby. We're going to look for bush babies and leopards and enjoy the, that side. We'll see in a bit. Well, it's not always about big cats. At night. Sometimes you just come around the corner and you've got one of my favourite animals on the planet. We've got a lovely herd of giraffe or a group of giraffe it's interesting, giraffe, uh, they will be sort of dispersed throughout this this open woodland here, browsing on uh, on different shrubs, mainly uh, sort of two different groups of uh, shrubs and trees called acacia trees and cambritum, uh, two more favoured uh, favored, uh, species for them. But they're also a little bit skittish at the moment, so... I'm just watching what's going on here. Uh, they keep looking around that way, and he's definitely decided to move off. I'm going to just turn around. You can see his silhouette there. Anyway, I won't. Um, I won't go down too further, too much further, because he's a little. It was nothing to do with us, that's for sure. And you know what, giraffes. One of the interesting things about giraffes is that they can scare themselves. Uh, you know, another giraffe walking through uh, can give them enough uh, sort of, of a fright for them just to take off and I think that's exactly what happened just then. What giraffes will do if it's a predator is they will all look in the one direction and they'll stay standing and they'll just look and they'll look and they'll look and they'll look for a long period of time and uh, they will, giraffes don't make really any sounds other than a roaring or a grunting sound if they do sort of see danger so you won't hear that very very often. Uh, they normally just stand and then they take off. But they also have an incredible uh, kicking ability. So they're a formidable opponent for, uh, or formidable, formidable prey animal for a uh, lion. Uh, I have seen a photograph of a leopard taking a, a young giraffe. So it can happen, but uh, normally they, uh, they get a bit of a wide berth uh, because of their leopard taking a, a young giraffe. So it can happen, but uh, normally they, uh, they get a bit of a wide berth uh, because of their kicking ability. Uh, and I can vouch for that because I have been kicked by one uh, when I was hand rearing one in the zoo. Uh, not pleasant, but they're incredible creatures and they all browse through the night. Uh, they spend a fair bit of the time uh, eating, probably about 50% of their day uh, is spent browsing along tree or vegetation lines. So. They'll be out in the woodland there tonight. I'm just going to cruise up this road here, see what else we can find. I've got the, the soft lights on. Uh, I'm just looking through here and wondering why they've stopped, but they haven't. They're walking on. No, they're walking on. Okay, um, I just had a question as well from uh, Grace in Finland. Uh, do giraffes have a good sense of smell? Well, you would think that most animals have a great sense of smell in the wild. They do, they have a great sense of smell, but their greatest sense of, or greatest sense is their sense of sight. Uh, that would be number one on the list. And then probably smell and hearing uh, on, after that. Uh, they have an incredible ability to keep, keep communicating with each other in a loose herd. It's never very a very tight herd unless it's at a water hole or a water point or something like that. Uh, but they, they keep, you know, within good distance of each other. They can normally see each other uh, and they across the treetops and move through. Uh, it's a very, very transient group. It doesn't have a great structure to it compared to like an elephant herd, for example. Um, there's no sort of matriarch. There'll be a dominant bull 
who'll come through and try and mate with many of them. But it's a very, very loose herd. And the males tolerate each other out of breeding season. Uh, but when it comes to breeding season, they drop their head and necks. You might have seen them wrapping their head and necks around each other. Uh, that's called necking and it's, a, it's quite a fierce battle. They hit each other. They've got two horns uh, on the top of their head and they've, got, they've actually got five horns altogether. They've got one down the middle uh, of their sort of forehead there. The two obvious ones are the two horns at the top of their head. And they've got, the males have got two very, very um, sort of structural horns at the back of their head uh, that protect the back of their neck. Now they're much more prominent on the males than they are on the females because the females don't really do that necking behaviour. They might just push an animal out of the way with their neck or something like that. But when the males come to that dominance fighting, uh, uh, they will smack their heads and necks together. It's a horrifying sound to listen to. You just think, oh, how can they do that? But those bony structures are there to protect them from that. Um, and you'll get some really scarred, gnarly old, old bulls that have got... Uh, great scars on their heads from that but hey they've been successful uh, so yeah we're just going to cruise on up here we've got about 16 minutes I've got a full moon behind me I've got a road in front of me and I've got you on the vehicle with me so let's carry on for 15 minutes we won't see what we can find spotlight here as well. Little dinky spotlight. The technology's got so much better over the years. We used to have these spotlights that are about this round and uh, you had to have biceps like Arnold Schwarzenegger to, uh, to hold the things up all night. And now this is super lightweight and cordless. One of the most fantastic things is cordless. You used to get this, and Pete, I heard Pete talking about it the other night, you used to get this silly cord wrapped around your neck and cord around things and, and now this cordless one. It's a great little spot and uh, allows us to see Now the thing I'll just let you know now is I'm not going to do this across and across and across in front of you and you, the camera, because that's just that's torture for you. So just know that you guys keep your eyes in the front and if you see anything there, I'll be looking off to the left and the right with this little spotlight and see if we can see anything. Spotlighting, there's a bit of an art to it, uh, all about respect for animals. Uh, we never put the animal, I, well, we probably pick up the animal by just a, a short uh, detection of the animals in the line. We take a look at the animal, we're blinding it, and uh, we just put a little wash to the side of the animal. But these two lights that I've got on the side of the vehicle as well allow us to. Um, to have a really good seat, field of vision in front. And because those animals, as I said, in, in, in the location we're in, to uh, the vehicle, they do have to travel at night on, and we come up whatever, walking down the road, uh, using the road as a pathway. I never look at a at a game a game drive or a safari drive as one was better than the other because um, I find that every single time you come out you learn something. The beauty of seeing that movie and having a chat to you about the silence of the African bush, or whether it's 
a leopard encounter or a herd. It doesn't really matter from the same bucket. And today was a little bit quiet for us, but at the same time, it's the anticipation. It's the anticipation of what's around the next corner. And uh, I really love having you on board. It's a great, great feeling to be to be here working with Wild Earth for Wild Earth TV uh, and for Nat Geo. So it's a great, great thing. We're really excited about it, and uh, I'm forward to. We've got about 12 minutes to go uh, before we say farewell and see you in the morning. I'm going to just see where Pete is. Uh, I'm not sure where, where Pete is. So just let me get him on the radio. And uh, <laughs> to make sure we've got two radios with two sends coming through our, uh, to us, it's quite tricky. Peter, Peter, do you copy? Zanelli, Zanelli, do you copy? Just going to pay a little visit to the hyena household. We're just going to have a little look up here and see if uh, anyone's home. I'm going to dim my headlights just for a second, just in case uh, there are people home. The last few times I've come round to the hyena household, um, they've all been out. this area here, uh, that's why we, we just approach so slowly and carefully, and there's nobody home at the moment. I did see one of them running up the track last night, uh, just as we were going up to, uh, to close uh, the safari. No one here tonight, so I'm going to just head on up to quarantine and uh, see if we can see anything to finish on. And if I know Pete, if I know Pete, he'll be uh, sitting with something very, very beautiful to finish on if I haven't got something already. And uh, I imagine he's probably waiting for me. I don't know if I'm gonna get up there in time, but we'll make a try. If I don't, I'll sign off to you, of course say farewell uh, and see you in the morning. It's been great to have you on board. As we always say, thank you very, very much. You never, never know, and I love that saying. I live on that. If you just take your time and see what's around the corner. 
Oh, that moon is spectacular. Absolutely spectacular. Just watch my aerial. tricks on me. Again, knocking up some trees as well. There's all these little nooks and crannies for the, for the uh, predators to hide in as well and, and wait to ambush. Uh, some oncoming uh, antelope or whatever they can get their hands on. Leopard are really, really versatile. They can survive on so many different foods. Hands on. Hands. Paws. Claws. <laughs> and some animals will use the moonlight. We've talked about that before. Uh, use the moonlight to hunt. Uh, other animals will also benefit from it by able to, being able to see predators coming. But at the end of the day, if we were to turn everything off, it's still pretty dark out here, uh, even with a full moon. I can see Pete's lights up there. So. I'm going to head around, I'm just going to do a little loop around and then I might meet up with him if I've got time. How much time have we got folks? I think we've got about five minutes. We might have a little, a little catch up here. I'll turn my lights off as I drive up to him. Come and say a little bit of, have a bit of a catch up and see what he's seen and what we've seen. I know he's seen some great stuff. Hey buddy. How are you mate? Hello. How are you? Hello. You've got a beautiful shot of the moon there, hey? Yeah, I know. We are, we're going to show you what we've been looking at just now. Okay. I just wanted to say hello. Yeah, I just saw your lights on, mate, so I know you've got a, a great moonshot there and you're going to finish, but uh, I just wanted to say farewell to the folks and I'll probably leave you to it. Uh, all over the place, but we... Yeah, bits and bobs. Lots yeah. of elephants, though. Yo, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll show you a picture later. Yeah, right. We saw one of the biggest tuskers I've ever seen. A Fantastic. Massive bull, so uh, yeah, look forward to chatting a bit later around the fire as well. All right. But for now, I think, uh, well, maybe if we can jump over this, I'll show you guys what we've been looking at. We've just been watching the moon. Brian in the back's been going, <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to say so, uh, um, thank you very much for being with us today. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Much for being with us today. We'll see you tomorrow morning at six o'clock our time till nine uh, nine a.m. our time, and then again in four, from four o'clock in the afternoon till seven p.m. Check the website, and it'll have all the time zones around the world and what you need to do to to follow us. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on board today, and I'm going to hand it over to Pete. We can drive off and uh, I'll see you tomorrow morning. Cheerio. All right. Cheers, mate. Well, welcome to the vehicle here with us. It's been a beautiful view. We've actually been sitting and I'm not going to move. I was actually planning to move a bit lower so we can get the moon behind the tree. It looks stunning. We came around the corner and the moon was just sitting there behind and the whole tree was sort of had this halo around it. Also because of this moisture that's in the air, it looked really awesome. So we took a stop and uh, I think we sat here for about, what, about 10 minutes or so. Just watching the moon rise and um, enjoying the breeze. The night sounds are magic at, in, in Africa, anywhere really. I mean, it's just unfortunately so many of us live in environments where the night sounds are all human or human made. 
But if you're ever out in nature, just, you know, actually don't like saying that, not out in nature. You can live in the middle of, cent- of, of New York or the middle of London, you're also living in nature. People tend to separate nature from cities. I don't know how we do that because it's all one place. But um, what I meant is you can be sitting out in the wilderness or just sitting out where there's more of other nature than just the human-made ones. And just listen, uh, it's the insects and the frogs and the crickets and a few birds and, and the quiet. Quiet is such a beautiful thing to listen to. I think we don't always do that enough. I wish I had more time for it. Which is brilliant, doing this. Now I have to make sure I have time for it. It's part of what I have to do, gladly. Think. Oh, it's not that different, but maybe a little bit different. We've got about three or so minutes to go, but I'm not going to wait to the end to say goodbye. I'm going to say goodbye now, and we just can sit and enjoy this view. It's a lovely view. I'm, I'm sitting very comfortably actually. Sort of made myself comfy in my seat. We have to sit nice and still. We're going to get a beautiful shot of this as well. But thank you very, very much for joining us. Thank you for joining us on our sunset drive. Thank you for joining us at any other stage that you have, and. Especially thank you very much for joining us in future as well. Remember what I said earlier, those of you that were listening. Let's uh, think about this a bit. Let's maybe try and plan and talk about the most witnessed live wildlife moment ever. Let's see if we can get a few million people or maybe a billion people. That'll be amazing. eh? Imagine a billion people all sharing a wildlife moment together. Think about it a bit. We're going to talk about it here and there. We've got about a month or so to go to to plan it. And... um, In the meantime, from myself, Peter Pretorius, from Brian. Brian, thank you very much. It was a lovely drive today. Thanks, Pete. I enjoyed the the talk as well, and I know everyone sitting on the vehicle with us enjoyed it as well. And uh, have a lovely morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you might be. And we'll see you again tomorrow for some more live safari out here in Africa in Sabi Sands. But I'm going to be quiet now, and we're going to sit here and watch the moon rise.